I invite you now to join me in prayer. As together we give thanks for this beautiful first Sunday of spring when we celebrate Palm Sunday in the Christian world. I give thanks for the rain that has cleansed and purified our earth. And I give thanks for the clearing afternoon ahead of us. I know that the cycles of this earth are guided by divine wisdom. And so I take this opportunity to surrender to those cycles as they manifest in through and as my life. I give thanks for each one here for the commitment that each one has to their own spiritual journey and for the love and the prayers and energy that they bring to Mystic Heart. So knowing that our time together this morning unfolds with love, joy, peace, and great inspiration, I simply release my prayer knowing that it is already answered even before it's spoken. So I just let it be so as together we say. And so, so, it is. so it is. Amen. Well, I welcome you this morning. If you're new with us online this morning, my name is Reverend Diana Johnson. I'm the pastor and spiritual director for Mystic Heart Spiritual Center. We're an independent interfaith community. We teach universal principles and practical spirituality. We open our doors in a welcome, trusting that you'll be led to the guidance and wisdom of your own Mystic Heart. We'll begin by joining our voices in prayer. invite you to enter the flow of the case, taking a long, slow, cleansing breath in, breathing in peace, and noticing the natural pause that occurs between the inhale and the exhale, letting it go, sending peace into the room. With each breath, breathing in the peaceful, powerful presence of the divine, pausing, and then sending that presence into the world. Becoming more peaceful, both within and without, as we breathe together feeling the connection with our fellow humans and with all other creatures. We share the same life-giving air. The breath connects us to the plants as well. Breath is life. Life is breath. There's nothing to separate us from life from one another. Every creature, every plant, every rock and grain of sand, 
every precious drop of water, all that exists, no matter how large or small, is an intricate and irreplaceable part of the one life. Take a moment just with your breath to feel the connection. Sensing our deep connection with all of life, we know it's time to rise in awareness and in action <clears throat> and to use the gifts we've been given for the greater good of all. It's time to use our discerning minds to choose wholeness over woundedness, peace over violence, to choose love over hatred or indifference, It's time to use our power of imagination consciously to create the world we want to leave behind. This month's theme is the sacred masculine, the strong, active, supportive energy that lives within each one of us. And today on this beautiful Palm Sunday, we come to a deeper understanding of a powerful example of the sacred masculine. This morning, we are rewilding Jesus. I use as my primary sources for Taze two beautiful books. First, Days of Awe and Wonder by Marcus Borg, and second, The Flowering Wand by Sophie Strand. Who was the Jesus of our childhood? Picture his image now in your mind. Maybe he wore a stainless white robe, had blonde hair, twinkling blue eyes, and a serious look on his face. Or maybe you grew up with a different picture, or no picture at all. This morning, I invite you into a new story. Slip on your first century Jewish sandals. Follow me into the lush, richly vegetated, densely flowering countryside of Galilee. Jesus, whose teachings were deeply grounded in the ecology of his region in agriculture, in the soil, enriched by the very bones of his ancestors, in the blood and food offerings of ritual. Jesus, whose parables spoke of the lilies of the field, the birds of the air, the lowly mustard seed. The itinerant rabbi who saw the probable fall of his people in the near future if their ways of life didn't change drastically and soon. There is a message for us in our own time as we look closely at what we know of his life. Who was this man we call Jesus? <clears throat> We say that he was fully God and fully man, both human and divine. This morning, we center our attention on his humanity and on what an utterly remarkable human being he was. By modern day scholarly accounts, Jesus was a Jewish mystic. He knew and experienced the spirit as reality. He was a holy man, not humanly perfect, but rather one who was in touch with the numinous, one who vividly and directly experienced the mystery and power of another realm. 
a mediator between this realm and the next. Jesus was a healer and was known for his miracles and exorcisms. He was one of many who made up a charismatic strand of Judaism. He practiced the spiritual disciplines common to the holy men of his time, fasting, solitude, contemplative prayer, and vision quest, or time in the wilderness. In his personal relationship with God, the Father, he used the intimate name Abba, Papa. Jesus was a Jewish mystic, and he was a wisdom teacher one who lived and taught a particular path or way. One that led beyond convention, beyond the familiar. He walked the road less traveled. He was a gifted teacher, quick-witted and clever of tongue. And he taught a subversive, or alternative wisdom, one that challenged the beliefs and practices of his ancestors and of the culture in which he lived. And like the prophets of old, Jesus was a social prophet, a voice of protest directed at the domination systems of his day against the economic and political oppression legitimated in the name of God. He was a revolutionary, passionate about social justice. He cared deeply about human suffering, and he saw that the cause of much of that suffering grew out of systemic injustice by the very structures of society. He was a peace-loving and passionate man. It was this passion that ultimately led to his death. <clears throat> We've heard it said that Jesus was not the great exception but the great example. What would it mean to take the life of Jesus as an example? To see him as a way show? It would mean living a life deeply centered in spirit. A life that seeks to experience the sacred in the day to day to live a mystical life. A mystic does not simply have a strong belief in God. She knows God, comes into direct experience of the divine, is in relationship with the creator, understands God to be an encompassing spirit that is all around us, that runs through and expresses as all of creation, and yet is beyond the world of form. A mystic senses that the only thing separating him from spirit is the membrane of his own consciousness. Living a life in relationship to the spirit of our own experience would be transformational. It would be very present tense, present moment awareness. Just as our human relationships grow and deepen, as we approach them with intention <coughs> and attention, so does our relationship with source grow in the same way.
Such a life would be lived by the alternative wisdom that Jesus taught. A radical centering in the sacred. In contrast to the life of conventional wisdom that most of us live most of the time. Conventional wisdom is what our culture takes for granted as true. It directs us in how to live and tells us what is real. It is a cultural consensus. It's what everybody knows. But conventional wisdom blinds us to wonder and awe. It causes us to create labels to put things in boxes, to turn the miraculous into the ordinary. Conventional wisdom reduces our reality to the world of the visible, the world of our experience, and directs us to live as though the material or the measurable is all that exists. Taking Jesus as an example, as a way shower in our lives, means raising our own consciousness so that we recognize and acknowledge the many ways our cultural system causes suffering for other beings and for our planet, and then seek to change it. The ethical imperative that is demonstrated by his teachings and his life is both personal and political. It calls for both compassion and justice. It calls us to go beyond our current way of thinking and feeling. <coughs> calls us into a radical decentering from the world of conventional wisdom and recentering in God. And a radical recentering in God does not leave us unchanged. It transforms us so that we begin to live more compassionately. This is the true meaning of the word repentance. Jesus had the audacity to rewrite a teaching from the Old Testament. Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. In Leviticus. Instead, in Luke, he says, Be compassionate as God is compassionate. The word for compassionate in both Hebrew and Aramaic is related to the word womb. Be womb-like, as God is womb-like. Be life-giving. Be nourishing. Be caring and tender. Be willing to serve. And when necessary, be protective, be fierce, stand strong. Compassion is not just a soft, fuzzy virtue. It can have passion and fierceness as well. Jesus was educated in the history of his people. He saw them headed for yet another catastrophe due to their loyalties and their blind spots. His teachings served to spark a renewal movement within Judaism that competed with other renewal movements of his time and certainly threatened a way of life that Jews had known and practiced for centuries. He was calling his followers into an alternative community, 
with an alternative consciousness. His acceptance of outcasts points to one whose identity is defined by his relationship with God rather than by cultural standards. He proclaimed the way of peace rather than war. He entered Jerusalem during the Passover celebration through the Eastern Gate on a colt, knowing that the Romans would be entering from the Western Gate on their stallions. He was both a humble and powerful presence who demonstrated the choosing of peace over violence, love over hatred, or indifference. All of a sudden, life can change. In an instant, scales can be tipped and nothing will ever be the same. This was the warning Jesus offered, the alarm he was sounding. He was not predicting the end of the world, but rather another kind of change. He was predicting a historical crisis for his people. He was criticizing the present path they were choosing and threatening destruction if they didn't change their ways. It seems to me that in many ways, Jesus would feel right at home in our modern world. For the time being, let us close in prayer, basking in the example set for us by this courageous and insightful teacher, and trusting in these words that he spoke, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work, and greater works than these will you do? The truth of this story, the tale of the rewilding of Jesus, resonates deeply. Putting God at the center of our lives changes our perspective. We begin to recognize and accept the one source as the wellspring of all we experience. The one creative power and presence, always available, always responding to us according to our choices, according to our intentions, our attention, our motivations, and our actions. forever giving us back what we send forth, always in love, always respecting our freedom. I am and you are an extension of the one source. This was the heart of Jesus' <clears throat> message. We are all sons and daughters of God, vessels for spirit's love compassion, and justice. It is ours to step into that truth, to make these vessels strong, to keep these vessels humble. Here in this holy moment, I am reminded of who and whose I am. I allow the truth of this message to permeate every part of my being. I choose the mystical path, the way of experiencing my own divinity and the divinity in everyone and everything. I choose the path of wisdom, that which leads to what my heart knows to be true, despite what the world may show me.
and I choose the path of compassion and justice, making changes day by day that bring my actions into greater alignment with whatever is in the greatest service to the whole. And so I dedicate myself and my life to the great mystery that I call God, to the deep wisdom that lives within me, to compassion and justice in my life and in my world, and to the courage and strength that it takes to stand in truth. Thank you, Spirit, for this day, for the blessings too numerous to name, those gifts that I would call beautiful and graceful, and those that challenge me to grow in character and resilience and faith. I walk in wonder. I walk in reverence and in deep humility and gratitude for your creation and for your powerful presence your wisdom and guidance in every area of my life. I'm thankful for all of it I rest, trusting and knowing that my prayer is answered even before it is spoken. And so it is. I invite you into a brief musical meditation. traditions very often because we like to move as an interfaith community through many traditions. But it behooves us to look at the great teachers in all of those traditions and to look closely, to study, to see what their purpose in the world was, what their message was. 
And so I thank you for sharing this Palm Sunday with me. I invite you now to uh, the practice of circulation. We offer an opportunity each week for you to share of your financial abundance, should you choose to do so. And if you're with us online today, you can go to mysticheart.org, and you'll find our donate button, you'll find a mailing address. Um, so we thank you in advance for your many gifts. They make this space possible. They make this, these gatherings possible. And at this time, they're being carefully guarded in preparation for a hopeful move in the near future. So as we offer this time today, I offer you a really brief farmer's footprint video from the first generation farmer, Greg Reese. I farm to grow the healthiest produce possible in close proximity to the end consumer. I think that several small scale farms is a really good answer to competing against a big agricultural company. I'm Greg Reese and I'm a first generation farmer. I'm a small scale farmer. I've helped start many gardens and small farms in Southern California. I focus on not tilling the soil and not using any chemicals or pesticides to promote soil health. Soil health is important because that's where plants get their nutrition from to fight off bugs and diseases and to also give us the most nutrition that we can get. We as consumers can demand a standard for our produce to be a certain flavor and a certain quality so that it changes farmers' practices. I'm trying to mimic nature. I'm trying to mimic how a forest grows, how a jungle grows. There's many species. It's not just one. So we as farmers should try to emulate that and not try to overpower nature and, and create it like a factory or trying to extract too much. We want to promote as much growth as possible, promote life, biodiversity, give life back to the soil and create a vibrant ecosystem. Biodiversity makes plants more resilient makes them taste better and it makes the soil better. I'd like to encourage people to know where your food comes from, purchase from local farmers, grow your own food at your own backyard. Growing really nutrient-dense healthy foods with healthy soils should be the least expensive and affordable for everybody. I'm Greg Reese, and I'm a first-generation farmer. Just realized that he's got fava beans all around him. <laughs> <laughs> so we thank you for your gifts, trusting and knowing that they come from the source, but move through your hands and through your hearts on their way to our community where we grow and expand them and then offer them back. So it is. So. All right, well, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, our local farmer's market starts the first Saturday of April, so write that on your calendar, support your locals. Um, and we're still contributing. We've gone to contributing monthly now to Farmer's Footprint just on a regular basis. Um, because they're doing such good work to, to regenerate so much land all over the planet. So feel free to grab a cup of something warm if you'd like to. Join us for our conversation at 1030. For now, we'll just bless you on your way. Make your soul always find what it's looking for. May your heart always read the way.
wonderful day. If you're going to join us for Easter next week, we're meeting for one service at 10 a.m. with lunch to follow. All right, well, welcome back. Or welcome. Or welcome. <laughs> well, even the people that just got, got here today have been here before, so welcome back. Okay, welcome back. Welcome back. Please join me in prayer as we open this conscious conversation with a great big shout out to the Creator who gave us this beautiful spring day. Thank you, Spirit for all the gifts of this day, the beautiful weather, the beautiful friends and friendship that we share in this beloved community. We give thanks for the inspiration of Reverend Diana's message today as we revisit our old friend Jesus and watch him be rewilded. <laughs> mm. That's going to be fun. So I just know that this time together unfolds perfectly, powerfully, joyfully, and with great inspiration and love. So I'm just going to get out of the way and let it unfold, saying thank you, Spirit. Thank you to each one here. And so it is. Amen. So it is. <laughs> thank you, Chris. Beautiful. So good morning and welcome, good morning. or welcome back, or however we want to say that. Welcome to those joining us online this morning. If you're new with us here online, my name is Reverend Diana Johnson. I'm the pastor, spiritual director for Mystic Heart Spiritual Center. We're an inter, in, independent, no, independent <laughs> interfaith community. And we teach universal principles and practical spirituality. Uh, we open our doors and welcome. And we trust that you'll be led to the guidance and wisdom of your own mystic heart. So we're going to begin with our jump up, dance, and sing time. Uh, joyful musical prayer and off we go welcome to the mystic heart join the celebration lift your voice and sing your part make this affirmation spirit made out Yeah. 
Hey, so bringing awareness back to the presence of spirit in the body as we do each week, letting go of all that holds us back, stepping into our highest potential and fully engaging our imagination as we join in the creation of a love-soaked world. Know with me now that we're creating a world where all humans embody and live from the qualities of spirit. Love, compassion, kindness, peace, generosity, justice, freedom. From this way of being, I feel the presence of a deep sense of joy. In this new world, all people honor and create, honor and care for one another, for all of the life forms that share this beautiful earth, and care for the earth herself. We remember that we're connected to all of life, that we're dependent on the planet to sustain us, and that we're dependent on one another. Being generous by our nature and living a life true to our nature, we give of ourselves freely, offering the unique gifts that each of us came here with, the gifts we came here to give. With all needs met for every person, each one is free to offer those gifts in whatever way feeds the soul. By our every thought, word, and action, we are creating a new story in which all beings are well fed, in which all beings have the safety and comfort of home and have a deep sense of belonging and purpose. We're so grateful that once and for all, health, education, and healthy relationships are supported and sustained by social systems that are grounded in wholeness and wellness. We welcome this new way of living, valuing every being for its uniqueness. We practice living authentic lives. There's no need to defend or protect. With love, generosity, and kindness guiding every human heart, our world is free of hatred and violence. We recognize the abundance that surrounds us. Giving and receiving flow freely in every direction, and all beings gratefully receive all that is needed to live physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually fulfilling lives. The planet and its beings thrive like never before. As we learn to see the sacred in everyone and everything, we walk in reverence and gratitude that all we have been given is freely given. We maintain this vision day by day, moment by moment, and we are not swayed by the appearances of the world. Each of us works to align our actions with our vision living these changes first in our own lives, with our families, our friends, our neighbors, and a new world is being born. In this process of profound change, this community stands as an open and welcoming place for all who seek support, belonging, and a sense of family. By the power of our deep faith, this prayer is acted upon even before it is spoken. As spirit knows our heart's desire and our heart's intent, in full expectation of its graceful unfolding, we release it to the creative power and intelligence that I call God, to the one that gets it done. And so it is. Amen. Ah. Bringing awareness back into the space wave good morning. You probably got a chance to say good morning to everybody already. We have a few people out there enjoying the, the no rain, I guess, this morning, too. Our theme this month has been Sacred Masculine. It's been a fun month. It's been a, the last two months have been really a lot of fun. Our topic of conversation this morning is Rewilding Jesus. And we started that process in Taze. Um, so I'm going to give a really brief recap, but there was a lot in there this morning. 
Um, so we started out by imagining the Jesus of our childhood. So take a moment and just in your own mind's eye, do you have an image from childhood of the Jesus figure? And then we recognize that some people might not have had a particular image at all or been aware, and that's also fine. But then we started to look at a different story, a different picture than maybe some of us got as children. What, so what, I'm curious, what pictures come to your mind when I say Jesus of your childhood, if there was one? Bob? Yeah, it's kind of a scary picture of Jesus up on the cross. Oh, yeah. Bleeding. Okay. For a kid, that just really made me sorry for him and scared. Yeah, okay. So the Jesus on the cross, Lucinda? Well, as a kid, it was either the blonde or the, or the brunette with the real light skin and everything, but that has changed. Uh huh. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, in Sunday school, we would have a little printed. Uh, lesson every week and I remember Jesus with the little children. Okay, Jesus with the little children. Nice. Chris? And I have the image of Jesus with dark hair, blue eyed, lighter skin, but superimposed. His heart was enlarged and uh -huh. it was called the sacred heart of Jesus and yeah. it was bleeding. Okay, sacred heart of Jesus image. Jesus is love. Jesus loves me. Okay. Song. Yeah. That Jesus loves me. This yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. Or the Bible tells me. So. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that one too. I still yes. do, I guess. Mm -hmm. Loud when I come. Yeah. So now picture with me where where did he live? What was the the area that he lived in like? What did it feel like? What did it look like? I saw a desert. Okay, you saw a desert. Desert. Okay. Yeah, so did I. When you okay. said lush and I think it, where was that? Right. So desert. That's that's a common image that people pull up. I'm gonna just read something brief from this morning because it applies. <clears throat> um, slip on your first century Jewish sandals. <laughs> and follow me into the lush, richly vegetated, densely flowering countryside of Galilee. This is what scholars believe was true at the time. And made the point that Jesus, is, whose teachings were deeply grounded in the ecology of his region, and deeply grounded in agriculture, and deeply grounded in the soil, enriched by the very bones of his ancestors. So that's a different picture than I get when I think, at least from childhood. So let's see. Oh, I did. I put it in here. See, I was gonna. I was gonna do that anyway. That's right. <laughs> so we said that that in addition to the teaching being very grounded in the environment and in the community which was agrarian in nature, that um, God was, f Jesus was fully God and fully human. We've been taught that he was both, he was human and divine. And we focused on the humanity this morning, on the humanity of Jesus. And what a truly remarkable human being he was. Um, historically speaking, scholars believe three things about Jesus um, that they tend to agree about. The first was that he was a Jewish mystic in all of what mysticism brings. Um, that he was a wisdom teacher known as a healer and an exorcist. And that he was a social prophet. So, a voice of protest against the domination systems of his day. He was a revolutionary. He was peace-loving and passionate. And then we did a lot with all that, but I'm zipping right through it. Finally, we reflected on what modeling our life after that example 
might look like and on what effects this would have on our lives personally and on our world if we were to each take that on. There was a lot of detail, so if you missed out, you can always pull up the video later if you're interested in hearing. So for today, I want to start our conversation in a place that I sort of left the Teze, which is in this statement, all of a sudden, life changes. In an instant, the scales are tipped and nothing will ever be the same. So that's kind of where we left it as this was a message he was bringing to his people in warning that if their behavior didn't change, that in an instant, everything can change. And when everything changes, nothing will ever be the same. So first off, do you think that that's a true statement that, that he was putting out there? Is that a true statement? In your life, have you ever had a time when in an instant everything changed and nothing was ever the same again? Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So what are some of those examples from your life? You get a cancer diagnosis. Okay, you get a cancer diagnosis. It gets your attention. It gets your attention. <laughs> a car accident. A car accident. Yeah. I saw their hands over here, but they went down. <laughs> Anything else? Um. When you get to the point in a relationship where you know it has it has to end, okay. it's over. Mm -hmm. so the done really, point. Yeah. <laughs> There's a done point sometimes in a relationship where mm -hmm. you can't go forward anymore. Or when you fall in love. Or when you fall in love. <laughs> that kind of a change in relationship. Mm -hmm. Any parents in the room? <laughs> <laughs> now there's a moment that changes everything, huh? Amen. Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. The, the loss, the, of, loss of a spouse, maybe. Right, the loss of a spouse. Mm -hmm. yeah. Things are never the same. Or a sibling or fa other family or, yeah, members. Family sibling, member. family yeah. member, even a, a pet, a oh. beloved pet. You know, we go on, we rebuild life, but it's never the no. same. Sometimes in life, the things that were supposed to happen don't happen. Mm -hmm. And the things that weren't supposed to happen yeah. do happen. <laughs> yeah. So we can never truly be prepared for the next moment, no matter how meticulous we are in setting everything up, stacking all of things, you know, in favor of what we just know is or is not going to happen. So what can we do about those moments, knowing that they're inevitable? What can we do with, with our time, with our lives? What things do you do in preparation for moments like that? Acceptance is, okay. is, the, is the, one of the big steps. So practicing a acceptance, acceptance yeah. moment by moment of whatever is. It's a good practice. Moving moving through what is. I mean sometimes okay. it's you know, you, you get can get stuck in grieving or or, or, right. or rejoicing or anything like that. It's basically you're kind of stuck in a place instead of moving through it to the next okay. to where you you know where you can come out on the other side. So practice in moving through whatever is. And that whether those are those moments where everything changes or whether it's just your day-to-day -day experience, practice moving through, through the valley. No tents set up in the valley of darkness. Yes, uh, um, Chris? The idea of um, the train with the station. I can't remember now what I was going oh. to say. Okay. Yeah. We'll come back that, if it comes back. <laughs> All right. But, um, we'll come back if it comes back. Lucinda? Uh, having some kind of a thing where you let go of control and you know that no matter what happens, you're not going to be able to control it. Because mm -hmm. God's, got, God's got the wheel. Okay. So letting go of our illusion of control. 
Mm. And that yeah. goes along with the idea yeah. of holding yeah. things lightly. And holding things not, lightly. Not, not being so tied to any one thing or opinion or just allow right. to be there and deal with it in that moment. Yeah, the Buddhist idea of non-attachment, holding it lightly. Yes. I thought I saw a hand over there. I'm trying to hold it both ways. Chris? And, and the Buddhist idea of impermanence. I, and impermanence, I like to say right. impermanence is here to stay. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the, the idea, and in, uh, in the Christian and Jewish traditions, um, it's the idea that this too shall pass. Okay. And that gives us comfort when things are not to our liking. But we need to also remember that when things are going great, this too shall this pass. This too shall pass. Mm. Yes. Yep. And that, the, that those things that will pass are not uncommon to, right. to uh, people, other people's experience. And so we, yes. we're, we're not alone. We're not alone. We're all going through these these circumstances, these moments, all the time. So, do we ever really know how we're going to react or respond when these inevitable change moments happen? We like to think we are ready okay. for it, but we're not. <laughs> we like to think we're ready. Yeah. And we know how we would Our respond. emotion kind of kicked in a different right. way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think the idea of unexpected change assumes that you're not really expecting it. Right. So it's, yeah. it's kind of <laughs> right. Kind of like you think maybe you're ready for something, but what it ends up being is not yeah. anything what you thought it would be. So. Right. Chris. And along that line, not being in denial of the emotions you're feeling. Okay. Good. So that you can acknowledge, mm -hmm. process, and get out of the valley. Right, move oh. through. Goes back to moving through it. <coughs> moving through it. So this is where the stories of Jesus demonstrate how maybe as a human being he had some different qualities than our average me and you. I'll speak for me. Um, you might be right in there with them, but no matter what happened through the stories, through his journey, and he he did he did have a feeling it was not going to end well for him. I mean, this this was something he was aware of. But what he did seem to know was that whatever happened, he would respond peacefully and lovingly. Now this doesn't mean <coughs> that he didn't have feelings or that he didn't have intense emotions. You think he ever, are there signs in the stories that he ever got angry? Yes. I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. What are some examples of Jesus getting angry? The temple. Yeah, the temple. Okay. Turning the in the changers. tables in the temple. He uh, rebuked the Pharisees. Okay. Call them a brood of vipers. Okay. He rebuked the Pharisees. Curse the fig tree. Curse the fig tree. <laughs> yeah, so there are signs that he was human and he had emotions and he expressed them. Was he never afraid? <coughs> yes. You have to be yeah. afraid. Yes, he, was yeah. afraid. He, he expressed fear. Examples of fear. In the garden. In the garden. Mm -hmm. he, was, he said he sweated blood. Okay. That's fear. That's fear. So the average person, I would say the average person, and I'll speak for myself as that average person, can change in the midst of a crisis. You think you're going to respond one way and then you find yourself responding or reacting another way. But it seems to me that he showed little sign of changing where he was standing in that peace and in that love, no matter what was happening, even in the midst of emotion. He was the same person no matter who he was speaking to. There was no change in personality shown speaking to one person versus another. 
when he was invited to the synagogue to speak, he knew the people there would expect certain things of him. And these would be things that he wouldn't do or couldn't do, standing in who he was. When he didn't live up to their expectations, they wouldn't be happy and that it might lead to his demise. He was aware in the stories, he's aware of all of these things. And yet he continued to speak what he knew to be true. So this is part of that example, taking him out of the white unstained robe and the blonde hair and the blue eyes and putting him in his culture, in his environment and in the the truth that he was standing in. So in society, how often do we face the expectations of others? <laughs> Constantly. Yeah. Time. Every waking moment. Every yeah. waking moment. And sometimes in our dreams. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Driving down the street, I expect yeah. that someone's yeah. not going to swerve in front of you. Right. Driving down the street, you expect somebody's not going to swerve in front of you. Or they're not going to cross that line. When you think about that, it's just a line. It's just a line. Right. Yeah. Or the other. Are there times that you feel like someone expects you to fall in line with their that view of how you should be? He has that experience all the time. <laughs> <laughs> He's going, hmm. <laughs> I don't think I'll speak right now. <laughs> Does anyone want to share a brief experience of feeling like you were expected to fall in line and you either did or you did not? Well, I don't know if this is the same thing. Mm -hmm. 9.30 last night my phone rang. It was my husband's daughter. And... Um, they're thinking about buying a home where there's something for me to live in when my husband passes. Mm -hmm. I'm not ready for that. I told her, I said, let me think about it. I don't want them to sell their home do that. What if I change my mind down the road? I can't make that decision now. Right. So is that a, trying to fall in yes. line with that? Right. Yeah. I know they're trying to take care of me. Right. Make sure I'm cared for. But yeah. That's a tough one. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you stand in what's true for you, mm -hmm. even with your children? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought. Oh, I was, I was just going to say, if more mundane is, you know, mm -hmm. somebody sent me a personal message on Facebook one time with a joke. And, uh -huh. and I looked at the, that and it wasn't funny to me at all. It right. was, I totally did, didn't think it was appropriate. And yeah. that person obviously thought that I would think it was funny and they were wrong. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it happens all the time, mm -hmm. every day, in little ways, in big ways. When people, um, I notice this in the, school, <laughs> in the schools, people will gossip and expect you to jump in. Right. Oh, yeah. And, uh, no. and if you don't play that game, they're, you know, yeah. there's some social pressure, the peer pressure there, there is. to do mm -hmm. that. Yeah. It's not just schools. That's it's pretty much people. any it's a place where people are able to go together, yeah. too. Anywhere people stuff. gather. <laughs> Even within families. Even within families, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a really glaring example, which I will give without detail, but I'll just say that Mystic Heart has come into existence after an expectation of not wanting to shift the truths, you know, and then something else is born as a result. You know, some things are just never the same. So, if you dare to be different than what was expected, the nicest people can turn on you. Mm. You find that to be true sometimes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the nicest in quotation marks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the best, <clears throat> kindest, most loving people can turn in a second. And they can judge you mm -hmm. if you don't conform to their expectation. 
They can ostracize you. You can become an outcast in a community. <coughs> Welcome to the life of Jesus. <coughs> Welcome to the life of Jesus. It's easy to talk about the love of Christ and following the examples that he set. But what was it he was calling people to do? Return to God. To return, return to God. Return to God. Love each other. Love. Radical love. Radical love. Mm -hmm. No matter what. Self-love. Love of neighbor. Love of enemy. Love of God. Yeah. Love. The whole message was love. And for that, it was outcast. That's it. That's what we're called to by his message. Love. Not to impose our will on someone else. Just to love them. As much as we want to conform to human rules and norms, just like that, those things can change. They're changeable. <coughs> So the only thing we can stand in is what we know to be true for ourselves and to stand in love. Looking at that, things can change. How many five-year plans do you suppose change when the pandemic hit? <laughs> you know? How many goals were put off or destroyed, not ever achieved, when that hit? Those things happen. And so Jesus was teaching that there was one constant, and that one constant is love. The love of God and the love that we, as conduits of that love, can extend to one another. And, and it doesn't matter how you translate love of God. If you don't use the word God, if you, you know, you can translate that any way you want. How, how do you, let's see how people might translate that for themselves in this space. The love of God, what is that to you? Do you have a way of thinking or feeling that? I've heard it called the love of goodness. The love of goodness. <coughs> Perhaps kindness. Kindness, the love of kindness. Compassion. Compassion. I think it's a, you know, we have an ideal of unconditional love. We think of God as being unconditional love, and, but the only way that that can manifest is through us. Right. We have to love unconditionally in, in order for that love to enter into our to world. To show right. up in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But in order to do that, one has to be willing to consider alternative viewpoints and ideas. Right. And that is a challenge for a lot of us that we get yes. married to our world view and we have to make somebody the other. Right. We are, by our nature as human beings, we're, we tend toward the dual, dualistic. Good and bad, right and wrong. Us and them. Us and them. Us and them. Love of God, love of everyone, love of all, including those that I'm not fond of and I know aren't fond of me. <laughs> <laughs> love of everyone. I think of just, if we think of spirit, we think of creator, we think of whatever you want to say. It's kind of like, <clears throat> you, can, you can look around and you see what God, spirit honors because there are things in nature, mm -hmm. things in people that are honorable and uh, beneficial and all those words. Mm -hmm. And I think of loving God as basically saying, yeah, he thinks those things are important, so I think they're important. Mm -hmm. so I think that's a way of loving anybody is to say, I, I recognize what you feel is important and I'm right. going, to, going to make that important as well. Yeah. So. I honor it by joining you in holding it as important. Yeah. So however you experience it, it's always with us. We can always see it. We can see it in nature. We can see it 
around us. Even while the world might be shaking and changing, I think um, in the Bible somewhere it says, I in the midst of you am there. So no matter what's going on in our lives, there's that love that we can fall back on. And this is nothing new. This message is not new. This is, you've heard this a million times, but looking at the world around us, I don't think we're done hearing it yet. <laughs> Something tells me. Um, the love of God doesn't change. We change. So the question is, what are we changing into? What are we going to change into? That's up to us. We don't need to influence millions of people, each one of us. Only the one right in front of us, whoever that one is. By our example. I think this <clears throat> connects into your talk about the imaginal realm, about the imagination. Yes. Whatever that was. Mm -hmm. um, because it's very easy at this point to drop into, I'll be a better person. Right. But I think there's a higher, I hate that hierarchy yeah, language, but there's a higher place from right. which we can use what you're talking about today to imagine, to bring up the energy, to bring up the vibes, use your whatever terminology you want to use to meet people in a place where spirit to spirit, presence to presence, we begin to resonate versus yes. I'm just going to be a better person and not be right. an a-hole right now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So know yourself to be the spark of divinity and know the person before you to be that spark of divinity and come together in that way. Come together in that way. And then everything else doesn't really matter so much. Doesn't mean you have to stay in the presence of people that you choose not to be around, that, that, you know. But honoring that we are all here on purpose and honoring someone else's journey, you know, maybe their journey is to be an a-hole to me today and my journey is to love them anyway. Mm -hmm. I was reminded of uh, the Carrie Cole song, Whenever the Time is Now, which says, Whoever you are is enough. Whatever you have is perfection. Whoever you're with is the one. Is the one. Mm -hmm. Right now. And right you here. love God by loving that one. That one. <clears throat> and I like that you said earlier that, um, that we change because I think if we think about whether or not our behavior will change somebody else, then I think we're going to be really disappointed. Right. <laughs> but I think if we if we are not so much being a better person, but basically being co um, conscious of the fact that you know there there's things going on in me that that God wants to bring to mind so that I can I don't know. Integrate. Integrate that in and, mm -hmm. you know, and that has nothing to do with the other person. Right. But it, it will impact the other person at yes. some, in some way, but it's it not, will. that's not what it's about. So. Right. Thank you. Chris. Maybe it's about learning to either change our expectations or drop expectations. Okay. About drop. Drop, drop expectations self, about self and other, right? And remembering everybody has a backstory. Yes, that person before me that's behaving in ways I don't understand has a story, just like I do. But that story is all unfolding in the relative physical, mental, emotional realm. And so, if I can raise myself into that divine spark place energetic and approach this person as the divine spark on a journey to bring something forth in me which is love that's a whole different way of walking through the world 
I think the radical part of that is that if we look at the life of Jesus, is that and he was doing that by by lowering himself. Right. And so he was basically making himself so that um, he was sacrificing all of who he was versus kind of putting himself above others. You know, right. The Bible explicitly actually says that, that he basically yeah. lowered himself. And so... He didn't know. lower his vibes or his energy. No. Right. right. Humility, yeah. meekness, yes. gentleness. That's right. what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe it's that he met people at their level. He didn't right. try to assume they were something they were not. So met people where they are, meet people where they are, and not, again, to clarify, not to lower. In fact, it takes a great deal of energetic focus and energy to maintain your own awareness of the divinity of another who's being an a-hole in your face and loving them anyway. It takes a great deal of focus and self-discipline and self-awareness and consciousness and willingness. And willingness. So ultimately nothing else matters. Love. Love is all that matters. I believe that this was the entire message of the life of this teacher that we call Jesus. We can all speak the language of love, no matter our religious affiliations, our political affiliations, our economic or um, educational background, status. We all choose to honor one another as the image and likeness, or we don't. We make it so complicated. We have all the reasons why, why we can't or why we don't. And as humans, we do have those reasons. And when we raise to a vibration that goes beyond that physical stuff, those reasons all disappear. There are no reasons to approach someone without love. And when we do that, life gets easier. Go figure. <laughs> if I'm judged, I can trust that this is part of my journey. I'm, part of my journey is to be facing judgment right now. And that the other part of my journey is to love anyway. Father, forgive them. Well, they, they know, know not, what, not they know they what they do. They know not what they do. As he was being tortured. As he's being tortured. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the life and the teachings of Jesus in a nutshell. <laughs> That's what I call, between the two services today, rewilding Jesus. Putting him back in his, what I believe is to be closer to his, his true story as a human being. Mm -hmm. Now there's a whole other aspect, and that's the divinity piece, and we didn't touch that today so much. But I'm going to close us in prayer. We have a tremendous lunch sitting over there today on this Palm Sunday. In case you weren't aware, I didn't say it at this service. We're celebrating Palm Sunday today. The truth of this story, the tale of the rewilding of Jesus, it resonates deeply. Hmm. Putting God at the center of our lives changes our perspective. We begin to recognize and accept the one source as the wellspring of all that we experience. We begin to accept it as the one creative power and presence, always available to us, and always responding to us according to our choices, our intentions, our attention, our motivation, our words, our actions. Forever giving us back what we send forth. Always in and from love. Always respecting our freedom. I am, you are, an extension of one life. 
one source. This was the heart of Jesus' message. We are all sons and daughters of God, vessels for Spirit's love, compassion, and justice. It's ours to step into that truth, to make these vessels strong, to keep these vessels humble. Here in this holy moment, I'm reminded of who and whose I am. I allow the truth of this message to permeate every part of my being. I choose the mystical path, the way of experiencing my own divinity, and the divinity in everyone and everything. I choose the path of wisdom, that which leads to what my heart knows to be true, despite what the world might show me. And I choose the path of compassion and justice, making changes day by day that bring my actions into greater alignment with whatever is in the greatest service to the whole. So I dedicate myself and my life to the great mystery that I call God, to the deep wisdom that lives within me, to compassion and justice in my life and in the world, and to the courage and strength that it takes to stand in the truth. Thank you, Spirit, for this day and for the blessings too numerous to name those gifts that I call beautiful, graceful, welcome, and those that challenge me to grow in character, in resilience and faith. I walk in wonder, in reverence, in deep humility, and in gratitude for your creation and your powerful presence, wisdom, and guidance in my life. And so thankful for all of it, I rest knowing that my prayer is answered, even before it is spoken. And together we say, and so it so is. is. So it is. Amen. Amen. <sighs> this has been such a fun couple of months. I'm having so much fun with it. Take a moment. Somebody else, somebody else did creep in. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I invite you to join in the celebration of the work that we're doing in the world by sharing of your financial good, should you choose to do so. And if you're at home and joining us online, you can go to mysticheart.org, where you'll find a donate button and you'll find a mailing address. You'll find information about a gracious giving program for those who would like to make a heartfelt monthly commitment or annual commitment of support. And so as we do this today, we're going to listen to a wonderful um, bluegrass group called Monroe Crossing as they present their song Micah 6-8. About a year ago, we were playing at a church in northwestern Wisconsin, and we saw this verse in, inscribed in a wall hanging, and uh, Mark and I were talking about it, and just, you know, the message is such a favorite for so many people, and we thought it would translate well into a bluegrass tune. So we hope you enjoy our interpretation of Micah 6.8. to understand we hate in turns we never learn an eye for an eye leaves both blind a pound of flesh for an ounce of crime and no one wins the wheel just spins he has shown you a man what is good what does Yahweh require of you act justly love mercy and walk humbly Shin 
without strain when grace is real we all can heal when we forgive another's debt we free ourselves to love and yet we honor those we miss the most he has shown you all oh man what is good what does yahweh require of you act justly love mercy and walk humbly these gifts. Thank you for providing these loving people through whose hands and feet these gifts traveled. I know that these gifts continue to circulate throughout the world, doing good, blessing all it comes into contact with. So I just say thank you to each one here. Thank you, Spirit. We accept these gifts with a grateful heart and a promise of wise stewardship. Amen. And that is that, I guess. So please join us in our closing song, Love Be With You. Yes, our, our Irish food theme today seems to have done well. There's quite a feast over there. <laughs> Yay.